So welcome you all here to the 21st uh, century of America, building a 21st century America. Um, we want to make sure that everybody knows that to attract economic development and to promote safe access for our cities and to grow them, it takes funding. And that is one of our partners here, which is Build America Mutual, or better known as BAM. They um, provide that funding for cities, and we all know that these, um, uh, this funding is vitally important for cities to continue in their growth. So thank you for being here, and thank you to our sponsor, which is BAM. We appreciate you. Um, we also want to, I want to uh, say, turn it over to my executive director, which is Clarence Anthony, and he's going to moderate our panel today of esteemed guests that we have. So without further ado, to keep us on track, Mr. Clarence Anthony, if you'll come on up. Thank you very much, Madam President, and, and again, welcome uh, to uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Democratic National uh, Convention, but also welcome to this great uh, discussion that we're going to have about a critical event, critical challenges facing America cities today. And I'm talking about infrastructure, the roads, the water systems, the broadband systems that exist in America right now. And as you all will hear today, cities are innovating to address our infrastructure needs, but to truly build a 21st century America, we must have strong federal partnership. We'll hear a lot about uh, that today, but first I'd like to start out by introducing a strong partner of the National League of Cities, and that's Sean McCarthy. In 2012, Sean co-founded Build America Mutual, BAM, that we, say, we uh, refer to it as, where he has served as its managing director and CEO. I'd like to ask Sean to come up uh, for a few minutes and, and share some thoughts about the partnership and, and uh, where we're going in America in infrastructure. Sean. Uh, thank you, Clarence, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm Sean McCarthy, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Build America Mutual. Uh, we're pleased to be the sponsors of the National League of Cities and the leaders that have gathered on our panel here today to discuss the outlook for the United States infrastructure. The Democratic, oh God, <laughs> uh, the Democratic Party's platform uh, recognizes how central infrastructure is to the nation. Infrastructure is an economic issue. Building and maintaining roads and bridges, schools and airports, creates jobs and makes business more efficient. Infrastructure is an environmental issue. Reducing congestion cuts carbon emissions and energy consumption. And as we all learned in Flint, Michigan, and dozens of other cities with neglected water and sewer systems, it is a health, safety, and justice issue. We're falling well short of what we need to do to maintain our current infrastructure system, let alone to accommodate new technology and new infrastructure demands that are fundamental to our nation. The Federal Highway Admission, uh, Administration says that we need to spend $17 billion just to deal with the 58,000 structurally deficient bridges nationwide. The American Water Works Association reports that 240,000 water main breaks occurred last year and says that we need to spend $40 billion per year just to maintain the current level of water service and safety. Add those repair and maintenance bills to the routine investment necessary to accommodate growing population and economy, and you reach a staggering needs identified by the American Society of Civil Engineers this past May as a $1.4 billion, $1.4 trillion gap between the nation's funding needs over the next 10 years and the current resources made available to pay for them. But if there was one takeaway we hope we can leave with you today, and that's this. Don't let the scale of the numbers we're talking about scare you. This is a problem that can be solved. In particular, there's a common misconception that municipal bond market, which provides the vast majority of funding for infrastructure in the US, is tapped out. But as you'll hear in a few moments from Sheila Amoroso, one of the nation's largest investors 
and infrastructure bonds, that's not true. Capital is waiting to be put to work on those needed projects if the resources to repay the bonds are available. It's a misconception to think that infrastructure issues have a difficulty accessing the capital markets. Issues as small as a million dollars or as large as a couple of billion dollars are financed every year in the municipal bond market. But to successfully have that happen, it's not access to the market, it's what's needed is a reliable revenue stream to support these projects. From 2000 to 2010, the municipal bond market raised on average 240 billion of new money infrastructure investment every year. Since then, investment has fallen to an annual average of around 150 billion. According to the Center Budget Policy and Priorities, from 2002 to 2013, 45 of 50 states cut their spending on infrastructure as a share of their state GDP. The municipal bond market is unique in the world in its capacity to provide low-cost, long-term capital to back local decision makers who identify essential projects that will help maintain and grow their communities. We need leadership at every level of government to turn these into concrete investments, and I mean literally concrete investments. Mm -hmm. At BAM, my partner Bob Cochran and our team are privileged to work with leaders who have already met that challenge, who work every day to expand on that success. Former Governor Rendell is one of them. He is a member of our board of directors and serves a unique role on our corporate board. Because we are a mutual insurer owned by more than 2,000 municipal bond issuers, who have used our insurance to save more than 300 million since 2012, Governor Rendell is charged with representing the interests of the public on our board. Our mission is to act as an industry utility, serving the municipalities and municipal market participants by guaranteeing timely payment of principal and interest on the mutual members' bonds and improving transparency of their financial statements so that their bond sales can receive higher credit ratings, attract more investors, and receive lower interest costs. We are pleased to stand with Governor Rendell with his record of public service to this state and city because bond insurance and municipal bond market broadly are tools that will be part of the solution to the infrastructure funding gap. Please join me in welcoming Governor Ed Rendell. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I apologize for not being able to stay, but I am also the host, uh, the chairman of the host committee for the convention, and so I have about three things to do every hour. Um, but I did want to stop by, one, to congratulate BAM. Uh, I am a board member, but they've put together a great array of speakers, including two of my favorite mayors, Mayor Reed and Mayor Buckhorn, who have done great things in the field of infrastructure. Look, the bottom line is, uh, we're not going to get a whole lot of money from Congress for the uh, Motor Vehicle uh, Trust Fund. Uh, Senator Corker, one of the best Republicans th there is, uh, co-sponsored a bill with Senator Murphy, which would have raised the gas tax 10 cents and adjusted it to uh, uh, essentially to, to a form of inflation each year so that they wouldn't have to vote increases. Uh, Senator Corker could not get one Republican co-sponsor. So regardless of who wins the presidential election, regardless of who wins control of the Senate, the ability to get 60 votes, 60 votes to close off a filibuster on increasing the gas tax is fairly nil. And, it, and it's a shame because Americans understand that you get what you pay for. In Pennsylvania, my successor, Tom Corbett, increased the motor vehicle uh, Ta essentially, it was an oil franchise tax, but pa passed on to the consumers, 32 cents a gallon over five years, which will make Pennsylvania the second highest gas tax in the country. Uh, I stood with Governor Corbett to urge Democrats to support it. A mixture of Republicans and Democrats did. Four months later at the general election in 2014, despite the fact that every person who voted for it, their opponent, whether their opponent was Republican or Democrat, their opponent used it against them. Not one incumbent lost, not one. The biggest gas tax increase in the history of the Commonwealth, not one incumbent lost. But regardless, it seems that uh, it's going to be difficult to get. 
uh, whenever I speak to groups, very intelligent groups, not as intelligent as this gathering, but I always ask the question, how much is the federal gas tax? And I will give two tickets to the next Philadelphia 76ers championship game. <laughs> if you can tell me to the tenth of a penny what the federal gas tax is per gallon. Anybody? 18 what? Close. 18.7. 18.7. But see me afterwards. <laughs> Although I don't think, you, you, you don't look young enough to survive till the Sixers. <laughs> But in any event, um, so we have to look for creative ways to do this. And there are many suggestions. And uh, I was a Brookings Fellow, and Roger Altman led a project called the Hamilton Project in Brookings. You should go online and look it up. I assume some of the speakers may touch on it. It talks about four or five ways for the federal government to help us produce money to do uh, just what we need to do without having an impact on the deficit. And one of them, would involve municipal bonds. It's bringing back Build America bonds. If you recall, Build America bonds was one of the ideas included in the stimulus. It was very successful. In fact, so successful in its last six months before it sunsetted, there was a rush by uh, municipalities, counties, and states to use Building America bonds. It's where the federal government agreed to pay 35% of the interest payments on those type of bonds. The federal government lost money on that because even though BABs are taxable, at 35% it was a loser. The proposal is to reduce the percentage of the uh, interest rate to 28%. At 28%, it's a zero sum. It would not affect anything. The taxes would overcome the money the federal government would lay out. But in any event, the best remedy is municipal and governmental bonds. When I was governor, we did over $3 billion in bonding. Pennsylvania had a very low uh, bond rate when I came into office and still maintained it when I left. But well, we used over $3 billion to do water and bridges and roads and uh, uh, electrical grid. And as a result, when I left office, Pennsylvania was the ninth fastest job creating state in the union. Uh, the biggest, uh, best record of any big state, any northeastern state in the union, and a great deal of that was because of infrastructure. And the one thing that uh, Sean left out in the things that uh, infrastructure does, spending does, it's, it's also the best creator of well-paying middle-class jobs. People who work on the site, in the factories, usually make between fifty and eighty thousand dollars a year. Those are the type of middle-class jobs that we desperately need that politicians of both parties talk about and that can be created with infrastructure. So this is a very important conference. Uh, uh, I'm glad so many people attended. I hope uh, you can all come up with some collective ideas to go forward. We need to start spending money. I would say $1.4 is too little. The group that I head up with, uh, Mayor Bloomberg and uh, former Secretary uh, uh, Ray LaHood, we recommended $2 trillion over 10 years. And that's not all state money or local money or federal money. It includes some private money. But we can do this. We can do this. We've always managed to keep our infrastructure number one. It is now, according to the World Economic Forum, number 16. We've got some work to do. Thank you very much, Mayor, Governor uh, Rendell. We really appreciate the opportunity to have uh, you come by and, and tee up this uh, discussion. Um, next, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, New York Mayor, Mayor Bill de Blasio. Uh, since first taking office in 2014, Mayor de Blasio has governed America's largest city while advocating for education, child welfare, and livability in five boroughs. Mayor de Blasio started his public service career as a junior staffer in Mayor Dinkins' office, uh, New York's first African-American mayor, very proud of him. Since those early days, he has continued to serve New York as a school board member in Brooklyn, as a council member, as a public advocate, and as a devoted citizen committed to the city's future. Mayor de Blasio, why don't you join us here at the podium and 
bring some wise words from New York City. Isn't it nice to be invited to the podium and be given the advantage of presumption of wisdom? So I thank you, Clarence. I thank you for your leadership. I want to thank everyone for being here. This is such an important conversation. I think Governor Rendell uh, gave us a good shot in the arm there about both the fact that we have to aim high and that this can be done. I was particularly appreciative of the example he gave about the experience in this state with the gas tax. Isn't that a, a powerful example of uh, how the mythology that we are often sold about the political consequences of bold action and uh, intelligent, forward-thinking action, that they're often misrepresented. I think it's a powerful indicator of the fact that when our public servants actually focus on infrastructure, the public gets it. The public lives it. They feel it every day. And I want to talk about the opportunity we have right now in the next year in this country and how we can grab that opportunity and run with it. It's in all of our interest to do so very vigorously. I'm going to speak very briefly, and forgive me, I have a couple other things I have to get to as well, but I, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here. I am going to be succeeded in the panel discussion by my uh, Transportation Commissioner, Polly Trottenberg, who was formerly an Undersecretary of uh, Federal DOT, so she can give both perspectives to the discussion. And I want to thank uh, Melody for her great leadership of this organization, and my fellow mayors, Kasim Reed and Bill Peduto, Bob Buckhorn, thank you for all you do. We've had a joy of working with all of you, and there's tremendous unity among mayors because we, we understand each other's works and we really try and back each other up. So thank you for all the great work you're each doing. Thank you to all our sponsors. Look, um, let me just speak about urgency and again that idea that the public gets it. So I had an experience, and I'll, I'll put this in the same kind of terms that uh, Mayor, as Governor Rendell did. Um, you always get told in the political discourse what the public understands, what they don't understand. Again, I always come back to what do they experience, what do they feel? Mayors perhaps are particularly well attuned to this point. We're the, we're the executives who are closest to the ground. So we listen, it's part of our nature, to what people feel, what they're experiencing. And nothing troubles people more uh, than infrastructure that doesn't work for them, be it a, a pothole, uh, a street that's not properly paved, a bridge that's closed down for repairs, or mass transit that doesn't run well enough because it hasn't been kept up right. Uh, all of these things really get to the heart of what people expect their government to do for them. And equally, uh, there's tremendous appreciation when we get it right. Now, I had an experience recently, it's been talked about a lot, in Staten Island, one of our five boroughs, happens to be the most conservative and Republican, a place that people don't traditionally look to for my political support base. Uh, but Staten Island was a big part of a repaving program we did for the whole city of New York. Polly and her team did an amazing job. We said there's too many parts in New York City where the roads hadn't been repaved in a long time. We made a big capital commitment to it. And the feedback we got from people who didn't agree with us on lots of other things, um, but could find real common ground on the most fundamental level. Their lives were improved when their block was repaved. It was as simple as that. And for a lot of people in this country, uh, they look to the political structures and government with a certain uh, frustration, a certain cynicism, because too many times they haven't felt that their basic needs were met, and they didn't get a good answer why. But when we get it right, it's something that really creates uh, energy from the public, and then they want more. And so I say that to frame the urgency point about the year 2017. I think we have an extraordinary opportunity ahead of us. Uh, I'm not going to assume the outcome of the election. I can say uh, there's a combination of factors that could come into play uh, that might be a, a golden moment for uh, a new level of infrastructure development. Uh, there are outcomes of this election that could open the door for reconsideration of the federal role in infrastructure. Now, uh, you might say, well, that's a little too optimistic. We have too much ground to cover given the, the gridlock and the challenges we face now. I'm going to argue that when it comes to infrastructure, we already have taken a big step forward. Because, and, and, and I'm very proud to say my colleague mayors, not only my Democratic colleagues, but my Republican colleagues as well, we all joined together. And Mayor Reed was a particularly uh, powerful champion through his role of leadership in the Conference of Mayors on the issue of transportation. Uh, we 
found tremendous commonality across regions and certainly across party lines. Uh, mayors are willing to band together to go see our senators and our congresspeople with a common message that this country has to greatly increase infrastructure spending or we just can't compete economically, let alone address the inequalities that plague us. And, you know, we met with Republican senators and congresspeople we probably disagreed with on many other issues, weren't necessarily focused on the needs of urban America all the time, but, but we found a lot of common ground. And, and one senator said to us, one Republican senator said, uh, I may be considered one of the most conservative members of the Senate, but on this one, uh, I believe it's a federal responsibility to get it right, and uh, second, that this is one where the business community in his state was speaking loud and clear, the farm community in his state was speaking loud and clear, let alone mayors, let alone the labor community. This is an area of infrastructure where there's a possibility for consensus that bluntly isn't reachable on some other issues in the short term, but it is reachable right now uh, all over this country. The fact that uh, the last highway bill after, I think, seven years of essentially being static we saw a $305 billion increase over a five-year plan. Uh, that was a big door opener to something much bigger and better, something along the lines that Governor Rendell suggested. So I want to urge urgency and audacity. Um, again, there is one scenario in particular, but I could argue uh, in any number of political scenarios that will occur as a result of the November election. There's a chance to get at least a core few things on the first rung of the agenda that might get action during that golden moment of a first year of a new administration and a new Congress. Uh, this is one I think has some of the best chances of success because we can build a truly grand coalition around it. And just one other point or two other points I want to make. One, I, I, you know, what Mayor, excuse me, Governor Rendell said about not assuming the political consequences. That's very important to uh, repeat everywhere we go. Uh, the public, again, might in fact not only uh, be pleased, but be particularly satisfied if we get infrastructure right, that few things are more essential to their sense of what they need for their communities. Let me add another point to it that's so important, because when business folks and working people hear this, it wakes them up. Look at other countries around the world. Look what they're investing versus what we're investing. It's just astounding. China invests 9% of its GDP in infrastructure. Europe as a whole, 5%. United States, 1.7%. And we're all feeling the effects of it. That's the kind of fact that jars people and gets them to understand. I'll finish with this. Um, I think we have a chance for that bigger federal action. I think we have to aim high. At the same time, all of us are trying to innovate. I can certainly say my fellow mayors and I, we try and put together whatever we can get our hands on, every uh, creative source that we can find to do what we can do to take another step forward in terms of better mass transit, better uh, transportation and infrastructure all around. Uh, in New York City, we came to the conclusion that some things were just staring us in the face and we had to act on them. We have had some parts of the city that have been developing rapidly. There's tremendous potential for uh, new property tax revenue, if we foster that development properly, that's particularly true along our Brooklyn and Queens uh, waterfront and East River. We decided to use that projected tax revenue to create a new streetcar line uh, for a host of neighborhoods that were really underserved by mass transit. It's not something that would have happened in our normal uh, transportation planning through our Metropolitan Transportation Authority. It was something that was doable because there was a particular combination of forces that made it possible. We seized the day on that. We also said uh, we're one of the great coastal cities, but Amazingly, the only uh, consistent ferry service we've had for years is between Manhattan and Staten Island. All the rest of the boroughs weren't served. Starting next year, we're going to have citywide ferry service, and we're going to build it out over years, take advantage of our waterways, get people off the streets. We're a growing city. We had a great resource that really hadn't been used for decades. With a pretty modest uh, investment, we were able to now start down that road. So uh, while we're waiting for the bigger federal action, it's so important to find each additional piece we can add to the equation. Our people need it, our people appreciate it, our people deserve it. I want to thank everyone for the work you're doing, and I look forward to gathering with you. It's been great gathering you in Philadelphia. I look forward to gathering you in Washington, D.C. next year as we go on the offensive to get this nation to invest the way it should in infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
really appreciate you. Thank you, Mayor de Blasio. Usually I like pictures with the mayor of New York, but he makes me look shorter than I am, so I'm going to not ask for that photo today. But uh, we're, we're just so honored to have uh, this convening uh, to continue this uh, discussion about infrastructure. And we have so many great leaders and panelists. We have our incoming president, uh, Matt Zone from Cleveland, Ohio, who hosted the RNC. Uh, we have other partners from U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, we have Valerie McCall uh, from APTA, uh, the president of APTA. So this is a major issue for all of us. So I, I want to transition into the panel because, again, um, cities are the foundation of our nation's success. And from small business to big companies, Cities are leading by creating jobs and fostering innovation. Cities are where America comes together, live, work, and play, and we raise our kids, and we make opportunities every day in the places that we live. It's in America's cities where we celebrate our common values and beliefs, where we mourn all together the tragedies of the last couple of years and, of course, the last couple of months. But you know, it hasn't always been this way, and it needs to be said that this election is a big deal. It's a big deal not just because the, the crumbling infrastructure. The choice of our next president of the United States is a big deal if we're going to continue to see the prosperity and opportunity that is available in America. Mayors, city officials, not Democrat, Republican, we are about trying to get things done, and Mayor de Blasio just spoke about that. So I've said this before, we got to stand up and stand tall for our citizens as local governmental officials and make sure that the issues that are impacting cities are on the forefront of the America platform. So our next president, we got to figure out how we can lift this issue up and other issues. Uh, the National League of Cities just released a report uh, called the State of the Cities 2016 where we really dabbed into um, the uh, State of the Union reports of every 100 American city mayors. And our research found three core issues, public safety, economic development, and infrastructure. And for good reasons, mayors know a strong economy demands safe streets and a world-class infrastructure. Across the country, critical infrastructure is in state of neglect and disrepair. One in nine bridges is structurally deficient. 45% of America households hold no access to public transportation. An estimated 240,000 water main breaks happen each year, and the crisis in Flint brought it to a head. But that is not, that's just in Flint. It is happening all over America. So there are clear steps the next administration can take, and we need to be at the table. Mayors, city leaders need to be at the table. And so we're acting, asking to act as a champion for tax-exempt municipal bonds, support adequate and reliable long-term funding for infrastructure, support connected transportation from air to railways, roads, waterways, and lastly, support broadband networks to preserve local authority. So today, I am so honored uh, to introduce this panel and have the first mayor to come up, and that is Mayor Kasim Reed uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, who's going to talk to us about his experience and what he sees. Mayor Reed uh, took office in 2010 and has earned numerous accolades and recognition for his work. You can come on up, Mayor. It's not going to be that long. <laughs> and, uh, and not just, and just fighting for Atlanta, uh, but his entire state of Georgia, being a former senator in the state. Uh, he has run the city with the balanced budget, advocated for public safety, restructured the city's pension liability. Uh, he also has served as the chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayors Transportation and Communication Committee. 
And, you know, I had a chance to travel with Mayor Reed in Paris, and we were not only talking about infrastructure issue, we're talking about the environment and how that plays in the success of the global network of America. So will you guys welcome Mayor Kasim Reed from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'm going to move in a little bit uh, different direction uh, from our remarks. First, Clarence, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you all today on an issue uh, really that matters every, to every single one of us. Um, but I think uh, that I'm going to focus my remarks on the fact that what we need right now is will and ability. I think that you need the political will to decide that we really aren't going to wait on the federal conversation. We're going to do both at the same time. And I think that you need the ability because we're going to need a partnership between the public and private sector because people are moving into city at unprecedented rates. And so it's causing us leaders of cities to have to catch up and move faster and move at private sector speeds. And so because of the massive amount of investment that cities require right now, um, we're going to need a relationship where we are attracting kinds of talent that we hadn't traditionally had. And we're also going to need to be respectful of the people who have been doing the job for years. That's going to re require an amazing amount of talent to meld that sanitation worker, that public works worker who's been doing the jobs for years with the young individual who has a knowledge of technology who can go through our sewer system and identify leaks that are both costly and bad for the environment and to get those individuals to work hand in hand. But what I'm seeing in Atlanta is we are at a moment that I have not seen in my public career. Right now we have the highest level of construction activity in the city of Atlanta in the history of the city including the Centennial Olympic Games. When I walked on the door on January 4, 2010, we had a $900 million infrastructure backlog, Clarence. Uh, today, we've raised about $600 million of that um, without uh, raising tax rates for our taxpayers. And we went to the public for an infrastructure bond vote within the last 18 months that passed at 86 and 88 percent. So the public's way ahead of us. They know that there are challenges that we need to take on, but what we have to do, will and ability, is to give them confidence that if they give us their vote and give us their resources, that we're going to deliver a concrete result for them. And so we have an initiative in Atlanta that's a series of parks and trails in Greensboro's preservation called the Atlanta Beltline. It's $400 million of public investment. It's $3.2 billion in private capital uh, that has been generated. That's about a six to one return. I think most of you all would take that kind of return. We just did a 20 year deal with Delta Airlines where we will have a $6 billion capital program at Hartsfield Jackson Airport. Once again, no tax raises, privately and public, publicly funded, but our airport is the largest airport in the world. Last year we handled 100 million passengers, but more importantly about 440,000 individuals derive their livelihood from that airport in my state. So the point that I think we ought to focus on is, one, we do need to push for the federal government to once again be a strong partner, but we also need to push to clarify the lines so they have less intervention as they reduce the amount of money that they put into the process. We have moved from the old 80-20 formula where it was 80% federal or 60-40 formula where it was 60% federal to a formula where we're happy to get anything, right? And so I think that the federal government has an amazing role to play, but that we need to be more focused from our own standpoint of having these public-private partnerships. Uh, I believe uh, that the Skyway deal um, that was done under the administration of one of the greatest mayors in the history of the United States of, the mayor of America, Mayor Daley in Chicago, set public-private partnerships back pretty substantially. So my mayoral colleagues, it's going to be up to us 
to implement and execute on public-private partnerships because that's where the money is to fund the infrastructure conversation we're talking about. And so what do we get if, our, if we do our work in this room? We have a real opportunity to get GDP growth somewhere between 3% and 3.5%, which is what the United States of America needs to be in financial health. We're floating around 2.5%, 2.75%. And I remember talking to an economist that said something that struck me to my core. You know, he said um, the difference between 2% GDP growth and 3% GDP growth isn't 1%, Mayor, it's 50%. Right? And so if we get to 3, 3.5, three then all of us are better off and all of our city's economies are better off. So my argument and the reason that I'm here today is because we need political leaders like the mayors who are in front of you and Mayor de Blasio who just left to have the will to put it to the public and ask for your support. And then we need a partnership between mayors and the private sector to make sure that we have the ability to execute on those projects or the public will never forgive us or believe us again. If we come to the capital markets and ask for billions of dollars in new debt and investment and don't deliver concrete projects that people really believe changes their lives, then they're going to give in to the kind of cynicism that we see all through our politics. That is one area where mayors in America still do better than everybody else. That's why you like to see these national politicians when they come into our towns they don't want to be on national news. They want to be on what? The local news. Because me and my colleagues, we still see people in grocery stores. And they get to walk up to us and ask us hard questions about a street that's not paved, or a park that's closed, or water pipes that are breaking, or an environmental record that is terrible. We don't get to go someplace else. Um, so as we think about this election, let's get to it, but let's not use it as an excuse. Let's spend more energy, more time, and more passion deciding what we can do alone. And I believe that that compels the federal government to assist us. And finally, I'll just say this. Cooperation is the key at the state and local level. The governor of my state is a rock rare Republican, but he did something that almost no Republican governors in America do. He put forward $950 million in tax raises for tax revenue every single year to go to roads and bridges across the state of Georgia. And he did it when everybody was saying, you flat out shouldn't do it. And so this level of partnership, he and I call it the 80-20 rule. We disagree on 80% of things, <laughs> but on the 20% of things, like transportation improvement and mobility and winning the war for high quality jobs. We agree on those things 100%. And because of that, in November of this year, we will have a vote to expand MARTA, the ninth largest public transit system in America, by $3.2 billion, which is the largest increase in our public transit system since its inception, following another increase that occurred just two years ago. It's because we chose cooperation over conflict and the future of our folks over other petty political concerns. With that, Clarence, thank you for having me. Colleagues, thank you for having me. And thank you to the sponsors. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Mayor Reed, for that, that great challenge and, and teeing up again the discussion that we're going to have today. Um, our next uh, uh, speaker um, is, I, I must say, uh, is a friend of mine. Uh, we have known each other for 25 to 30 years from Florida. We were in the YDs years ago together, and I had an afro and his hair was dark. So now you see the difference. All right. But since uh, 2011, uh, Mayor Buck, uh, Bob Buckhorn has tirelessly worked for our state and promoted uh, the Tampa Bay region. He is the mayor of Tampa, Florida. Um, 
the economic development ideas that he's created in the city, the stability, the business partnerships. Uh, he has secured Tiger Grant uh, funding and fought for numerous infrastructure improvements in, in the city. Uh, he served on the city council um, and uh, also uh, you worked for Mayor Sandra Freeman back uh, years ago. So um, Mayor Buckhorn is a great leader in the state and our nation and so I ask him to come and, and share some words of wisdom with us today. Mayor Buckhorn. It was a heck of an afro too. <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> and we have been uh, friends for a very, very long period of time. He was the, uh, the mayor of, what, South Bay? Yes, a tiny little place between Tampa and Miami in the, uh, back off the Everglades and was the mayor for, I don't know how long, Clarence, 20 years? Yeah, it's good, it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's good. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Clarence has always been a friend to mayors and certainly a friend to Florida mayors. It was good to see, although he left when uh, Governor Rendell left, uh, to see Secretary Cisneros here. For a lot of us, he was the role model for mayors. Many of us, you in this room will recall uh, the San Antonio's explosion onto the national scene, largely led by a early 30-something Harvard-educated uh, mayor by the name of Henry Cisneros. And he, for a lot of us who sort of grew up admiring mayors, really became the model for which all of us um, hoped to achieve, obviously went on to be the Secretary of, of HUD on, in the Clinton administration and did amazing work. And so it was really great to see him here as well. Um, you heard from Mayor Reed, you heard from Mayor de Blasio, you're going to hear from Mayor Peduto shortly from Pittsburgh. Um, cities in various stages of uh, their economic growth. Uh, you obviously heard from the largest city in America. Uh, you heard from the city in the south that emerged as uh, a place that was too busy to hate and has literally blown up in a positive way as a major, major economic powerhouse in, in a global economy. Um, to my Sunbelt City, uh, that is the largest media market in the state of Florida and a city that has led the state in three out of the last five years in new jobs created and is really driving Florida out of what was the worst recession since the Great Depression in a state that literally was knocked to its knees uh, by that recession. Unemployment was north of 11 percent. We had 4,000 some houses in some state of mortgage foreclosure in our city and we have emerged out of that in much better shape to a one of America's greatest cities, uh, the city of Pittsburgh, uh, that went through a, a catastrophic uh, collapse as the steel industry collapsed but has embarked on what is one of the most miraculous transformations of a older industrial city and if you haven't been to Pittsburgh you need to go see uh, what Mayor Peduto has has done there and to see that strong powerful broad-shouldered city uh, come out of that wreckage of the last 25 years to a city that is is innovating that is transforming that is growing but I will tell you at the core of all of that and our issues are a function of scale Mayor de Blasio has got a much bigger um, environment in which he has to uh, to work, but I'll give you just one example of how infrastructure impacts the quality of life of our cities. And bear in mind, you're talking to four mayors um, that are hands-on, that are on the ground. That's what mayors do. We are a different, different breed of cat than most of the electeds in America. Because as uh, Mayor Reed said, we don't get to go and run away and hide. We don't go off to Tallahassee or go to Washington, D.C., where no one knows who you are or what you do. When you're a mayor, they show up at your house. Fortunately, I've got a 120-pound German Shepherd for those <laughs> that I don't want to see. But they stop you in the movie theaters. They stop you at dinner. They, you, go to, to, you pick your kids up at school in the pickup line. I mean, we are real people. But our citizens have access to us. They will stop you and tell you to a person where that pothole is and how they hit that every time they're going to the store, they're going to the work. Or they want to know where that sewer cave-in is or why is that park closed up. Mayors are different. We aren't allowed the luxury of rhetorical excesses. We're required to deliver on what we were sent there to do. And so the confidence that people have in their mayors for the most part is very different. It is a uniquely different relationship 
uh, to the people that we serve versus other elected officials. And so infrastructure matters for us. About this time last year, we had a rain occurrence in Tampa, Florida. It rained for 11 straight days. Um, the ground was saturated. Um, I had to leave my, I was on vacation in the mountains and left. As a result of that rain occurrence, and entirely due to that rain occurrence, we had 5,000, and we knew because we counted, new potholes. 500 sewer cave-ins. Because as a result of that rain, we were pushing three times the amount of stormwater through our system, over 60 million gallons a day through that system, um, that was three times what the capacity of the system was. 5,000 potholes emerged as a result of that storm, and 500 cave-ins. Infrastructure matters. Infrastructure matters in terms of our ability to attract talent. And all of us recognize as mayors that our future is going to be determined by our ability to attract intellectual capital. Those bright young people who can choose to live anywhere in the world that they want to live. They can choose to live in Mumbai, India, or Durban, South Africa, just as easily as they can choose to live in Atlanta or Pittsburgh or Tampa, Florida. And so creating that urban environment that they want to come and be a part of is critical to our ability to succeed moving forward. Roads, bridges, sewer lines, ports, and airports. We're in the midst of a billion dollar expansion of our airport. Our port, Port Tampa Bay, is the largest port in the state of Florida. Port of Miami is 500 acres, Port Tampa Bay is about 5,000 acres. We are the closest port to the Panama Canal. If you don't think infrastructure matters in terms of job creation and our ability to compete on a global stage, our ability to move those goods that are coming through the Panama Canal through the southeast United States requires roads, requires bridges, requires gantry cranes, requires rail, requires us to get those goods to market faster than other ports that we may be competing with. It's important. The Port of Tampa alone in, in Tampa is responsible directly or indirectly for over 80,000 jobs. Infrastructure means jobs. Infrastructure means increasing and enhancing the quality of life of the people that we serve. We've got a governor. I'd love for that 80-20, Kasim. I got a governor that gave back $3 billion to the federal government that was supposed to build a high-speed rail, the first one in the nation from Orlando to Tampa. Gave it back. Now, how stupid is that? I mean, come on, give me a break. That would have connected the two major cities in the I-4 corridor. It would have created tens of thousands of new jobs. It would have given mobility options. Our ability to compete for those young people I talked about requires that we have mobility options. And in a state like Florida, where the development patterns have always been suburban, not urban, where people want to go and live in a house with a two-car garage and they want to come in and close the garage door and not even talk to their neighbors, we need mobility options. And rail has got to be a part of it. And so for us to be competitive on the global stage, and bear in mind, I'm not competing with Pittsburgh. I'm not competing with Atlanta. I'm not competing with Alabama. We're competing with metropolitan regions around the globe. And if you want to be a global player, you have, a, have to have a global infrastructure network. It is critical to us. I wish the folks that we hear out there on the street hooting and hollering were hooting and hollering about water and sewer and bridges and other things that would really drive this economy and allow us to create wealth. Those debates are important, and we will have those debates. But if you want to, to minimize income inequality, give someone a job. And if you want to make sure that your city is competitive, which means you're going to be able to attract talent, which means you're going to be able to grow your economy, give someone a job, invest in infrastructure. They ought to be talking about that. The Democratic Party ought to have more than three paragraphs in their platform about investments in infrastructure, because I can tell you, for. For cities all over America, if we're going to succeed, and that partnership has to be there, I oftentimes wish the federal government would get out of our way and just let mayors do their jobs. But we've got to have the tools to be able to invest. Part of it is financial tools. Part of it is a commitment to joining with us as mayors to help rebuild our cities, because that's the economic engine of America today. That's where the people are living. That's where the, environment, the, um, the technology infrastructure is in place. That's where the ecosystem for entrepreneurs exists. 
that's where the best and the brightest want to be. It is in the urban areas of America. And if we don't recognize that and celebrate it and honor that diversity and allow us to continue to grow that urban economy, shame on us. Shame on us. Because America will be weaker if we don't start fixing our roads and our bridges and our ports and our airports and putting people back to work, as Mayor de Blasio said or Mayor Rendell said, in good, high-paying jobs that allows them to move on to the middle class and beyond. It makes all the sense in the world. Let's go get it done. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Buckhorn. Uh, one question before we start. Are you the next governor of the state of Florida, or are you going to? <laughs> Thanks again, uh, Mayor Buckhorn, for your passion and commitment to local government. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mayor uh, Bill Peduto, who will be hosting, uh, this is an advertisement, I'm be bold and clear, our National League of Cities Conference in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, November, and we look forward to being there with over 4,000 uh, local government officials. Um, you may be familiar with the transformation of Pittsburgh and, uh, and what it's overgone the last few de decades. The Steel City is now known as a hub for technology and innovation. And Mayor Peduto has played an important role in the city's rebirth. And we're just so proud of what you have done over the last few years. After 19 years on the city council and serving and since taking office in 2014, he's been committed to making the city government more transparent and more responsive. He's helped uh, champion uh, a $2 billion redevelopment of the city's East End and has played a pivotal role in the city's resurgence as the 21st century city. He's also a member of the Board of Directors of the National League of Cities. That's another plug. And so will you please welcome Mayor um, Bill Peduto. He also brought Pittsburgh back to the NLC after almost 30 years as not a member. Uh, first off, what an honor to be here with Mayor Reed, with Mayor Buckhorn, and with the other Italian-American progressive class of 2013 mayor named Bill. Um, you want to talk about challenges. We've got 58 square miles in Pittsburgh. We have 446 bridges. Uh, the most bridges of any city in the world, and yes, that includes Venice. And we have an aging infrastructure that was basically built a generation ago that hasn't seen the investment being made by the state or the federal government in trying to keep that infrastructure basically safe, not even up to scale, but being safe. But if you add on top of that, and you think about the transformation of Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh never planned to fail, it just failed to plan. No one ever had assumed that there was gonna be a day that the mills would close. That was not even in anybody's imagination. And when it did happen, it hit hard. Our, our unemployment rate was double what Detroit's is today. It was higher in the 80s than it was during the Great Depression. We lost more people than New Orleans lost after Katrina. And our debt ratio of our city was greater than New York City's when it went bankrupt. And after 30 years, the city transforms, it adapts. But that overnight success story took 30 years of planning in order to be able to be reborn, and reborn into something that we weren't before. If you think about infrastructure, you have to think about that same thing. Because in one sense, we're moving towards new mobility options, mobility, that is electric, that is shared, that is autonomous. And at the same time, we're talking about gas taxes. What happens when vehicles don't use gas? Are we preparing and are we getting ready for that transformation? Because it's coming, it's real. If you don't think driverless cars are a part of the immediate future, come to Pittsburgh. We already have two operations with driverless cars on our streets. One being done by Uber, it's committed over 400 employees now that are working in creating this new global trend, and other by Carnegie Mellon University. And if you think about the way that we design cities, you know, for thousands of years they were designed around people, and then after World War II we designed them around the automobile. And all of a sudden we looked at neighborhoods that were low income, 
and we came in with the wrecking ball and the bulldozer and we built highways through them and we built wider roads where buses running on diesel created rivers of carbon and in those neighborhoods we had no real mobility options to where jobs were being created because we didn't think about it and put it into the design plan at first. We have the opportunity to make amends of those mistakes that were made in urban planning from generations ago. To be able to look at those same neighborhoods and using electrical vehicles in order to be able to lessen the amount of pollution. Within African American communities throughout this country, the asthma rate of children is the highest in urban areas. And that's by design, because that's where we put the heaviest equipment and the vehicles traveling through. We have an opportunity not only to build out new corridors of transportation, but look at a new model of 21st century energy, direct energy being produced right there in the neighborhood to be able to provide energy for it. Getting off of the grid system that is susceptible to man-made disaster, natural disaster, and being able to provide lower cost energy in our urban areas. You want to create affordable housing, create affordable utilities as well, and then connect it through transportation. Because the further you push people out in a city, they may pay lower rent, but they're paying more for the need to get to their job, the need to get to medical, the need to buy food. And it has to be a part of seeing all of these challenges now, because they all overlay. And the mistakes we made before can be solved as we look at mobility, as we look at energy, and we add to it social mobility and make it part of the process from the beginning, not something we try to add on after the fact. That's where America is right now. We have the opportunity to look at everything when it comes to infrastructure, from damaged combined sewer overflow systems that can be adjusted through sensors to be able to take water into different areas without having to build a lot of new, to the opportunity of never having that water even hit the system by building green development in neighborhoods that don't even have a park and being able to retain that water and restore neighborhoods at the same time. And we can do this with the resources that can be made available if federal regulations come with it, stipulations that make sure that this type of development is how we want to see our cities grow. In Pittsburgh, in the 50s, we built a lot of bridges. We built tunnels. We spent billions and billions of dollars on highway systems. And then we're surprised when people moved out on these brand new driveways that we spent all this money on. We didn't build a light rail system. We didn't build a system to be able to keep people in our city. And we went from a city of 720,000 to a city of 310. By design. If we use these resources in a smart way to be able to see that development occur, we can build up Pittsburgh, Detroit, Buffalo, Cleveland, and cities throughout this country and provide more than just transportation and energy mobility, but provide the promise of what this should do, social mobility. Thank you, uh, Mayor Peduto. I uh, really appreciate those remarks and, again, the challenge that we have to face as uh, local governmental officials. Um, our final speaker today is uh, Sheila Amoroso, uh, Senior Vice President and Co-Director of Municipal Bond Department from Franklin Templeton Fixed Income Group and Portfolio Manager of Franklin Federal Tax-Free Fund, uh, uh, Tax-Free Income Fund. Uh, Ms. Amoroso joined Franklin Templeton Investments in 1986 and holds a bachelor's degree from San Francisco State University and an MBA from Notre Dame. University, please join me in welcoming Sheila again. What a great panel today. I'm not including myself yet, but it's great to be surrounded by people who get it, who get that infrastructure financing in the United States is vitally important, and really the mayors and the cities are the people that are on the ground, and they're experiencing everything 
very close, as one of the mayors said, that people stop them on the street and give recommendations. Franklin Templeton Investments has been investing in, infra in infrastructure in the United States for over 40 years. We have 30 funds that investors can invest in their communities. We have 22 that are state specific. We do have New York, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Georgia specific funds. So investors can invest in our funds <coughs> while they're investing in their communities and earn a return. Two thirds of the infrastructure in the United States is built using municipal bonds. And it is a, a market that is heavily retail driven. That is unlike um, you know, any other market where they're primarily institutional investors. So with the retail mom and pop investor in the muni market, the way I look at this is that the tax exemption encourages individuals to invest in their community and they earn a return, which helps keep financing costs low. So it's a win-win situation. And I call it the circle of life. So the tax exemption encourages individuals to invest in their community, they earn a return, and it's a win-win situation for the state and local governments. That's why the tax exemption is vitally important, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the muni market continues to provide a very steady flow of capital into, in, into the muni market and, and for investing in infrastructure. So there's plenty of capital to invest. However, right now there's actually more capital than available projects. And that's problematic, obviously, because we have a lot of infrastructure needs in this country. But the lack of infrastructure building isn't due to the lack of capital. It's due to the constrained revenue environment of state and local governments. As outlined in the latest National League of Cities fiscal survey, the three areas causing budget stress for local governments are infrastructure funding needs, uh, pensions, and health care for their public employees. These three are connected together and in conflict with each other right now. Unfortunately, from the pension and healthcare perspective, um, when the promises were made, the funding was not made. And so now you have promises that were made years ago impacting budgets today from the unfunded liability standpoint. So that's causing, you know, obviously caution for city leaders in looking at their future budgets and how they're going to finance and pay for the infrastructure needs of their cities. These are also issues that are causing concern for municipal bond buyers. Uh, buyers are shying away from cities that have large unfunded liabilities um, because we have seen in the past recent bankruptcies, uh, municipal bond holders have been taking haircuts that are much higher than historical averages and uh, much higher than expectations based on even the highest security uh, securities in our market and that's causing concern. So they're shying away from uh, situations where um, you know, they could be at risk. As you probably are aware, Chicago, which is in the news regularly, uh, has seen their cost of capital uh, rise dramatically due to their unfunded liabilities. You know, at this point, we really need to have an honest dialogue about how to handle, in a very fair and balanced way, these unfunded liabilities. Fair not just to the retirees and the employees, current employees, but also to the residents, the taxpayers, and the creditors. And it would be great if we could have a very fair and balanced dialogue of how to solve that problem, because I think this is one of the biggest problems impeding our ability to finance infrastructure, because it's a lack of revenues to support new infrastructure projects that is one of the primary uh, concerns for trying to finance infrastructure. And then finally, I want to talk about this, the tax exemption. We need to continue to spread the message and educate Congress about how vitally important the tax exemption is to financing infrastructure in the U.S. Unfortunately, uh, the, the way the federal government looks at this, and, and you know, that includes the Joint Committee on Taxation as well as a lot of academics, is what the tax exemption costs to the federal government and who owns munis. The most important factor when looking at how we finance infrastructure is how to attain the lowest cost of financing for those people paying for it, which is essentially the residents of cities and states. So that's basically every American. 
At the end of the day, the people that benefit from the tax exemption are every resident of a city and state in our country. Once again, every American. Those are the people that benefit. We all benefit. So the primary objective when analyzing, you know, how to finance infrastructure in the U.S. from the federal government's perspective should be really how do we attain the lowest cost of financing for infrastructure. Now, if, you know, we've heard about the 28 percent cap potentially and potentially taxing munis, um, all that would do was ra would raise the cost of financing and shut out you know, many smaller local governments from financing the infrastructure because then they would have to essentially compete on the world stage. We do deals in our market, over 10,000 a year d deals, that, and some are, are a million in size or less than a million in size. They're never going to be able to compete in the world stage. So we have to continue to focus on educating Congress and sharing the message for all to hear that financing the infrastructure in the United States and the tax exemption go hand in hand. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sheila, for again uh, grounding uh, this uh, conversation that we're going to, to have. Um, this is our opportunity to have uh, uh, some engagement with the panel. And uh, I'm also going to just forewarn you that we'll, we'll open up an opportunity for uh, the audience uh, to ha ask any questions that you may have. And we will make sure that there are questions um, that come out of, uh, of this as well. Let me, let me just start uh, by asking uh, the panel um, a very broad question, but specific. Just imagine that you were elected uh, President of the United States of America in January of 2017, you're sworn in. What would you do uh, to deal with the infrastructure issues as it related to partners with, partnership with cities? If you were in that position, sworn in in 2017. Mayor Reed? Well, after I called my best friend and said, can you believe they elected me president of the United States? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, what I would do, I, I would do two things. Uh, one, uh, I would look at all of the best work that was done on getting a deal around an infrastructure bank and infrastructure investment in the United States uh, and really pull some folks together who uh, I believe haven't gotten the credit that they deserve. Uh, I've seen a real willingness among individuals on the Republican side, uh, such as Chairman Schuster, who helped uh, get the expanded um, highway bill done. And I think that uh, I would go to the American people and have a conversation about selling them on what having an infrastructure bank would mean for the economy. If you look at the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, for all of the criticism of it, it was a $783 billion investment uh, in the United States economy at a critical time. About 10 percent of that was directed to infrastructure. Of the verifiable jobs that came out of the American uh, Recovery Act, 35 percent of them related to infrastructure and roads. And so I would use my political capital to get a deal around an infrastructure bank um, for American cities and counties. That would be the first thing that I did. The second thing that I um, would do would be to call um, the leading investors in infrastructure both domestically and from around the world and I would get them in a room with the uh, mayors of the 50 largest me metros and I would host a meetup so that all of the transactions that those mayors and county officials have an interest in I would literally put them with banks that could finance those transactions but I would do one thing that was a little different uh, I would um, go to Congress for the capability to backstop those transactions and make them more attractive. So some of the risk that the private market might be taking in order to finance municipal deals, uh, I would use the government as a backstop for that rather than having the government be a bailout for something that has occurred uh, badly. Those would be the two initiatives I would try. It certainly would score me some points with my 10-year-old daughter. Um, <laughs> who thought when I got elected mayor that the Secret Service was going to take her to school. Um, and, and I wouldn't vote for Kasim because if he limited it to 50, he kept Peduto and I out of that meeting. So you have to expand your, uh, make it at least the top 60 cities. 
Um, Clarence, my sense is that if this administration and the next president is going to focus on urban initiatives, then we need to create an office of urban initiatives that has the weight, um, maybe not of a secretary level, uh, but of significant weight that will have that will be at the table uh, when these things are talked about. I mean, the fundamentals that Kasim just mentioned, I absolutely support. Uh, but if you're not at the table, you're lunch. And we need to be at the table. And, and we, we get bits and pieces of it through DOT, bits and pieces of it through HUD, um, some through Commerce, um, all of whom have been very helpful in this administration, has been extremely helpful to cities and mayors around the country. But I think if we're going to elevate this issue to the point that it gets the recognition that it needs and deserves, it has got to occupy a place in the bureaucracy that warrants uh, that occurring. And so um, if I were fortunate enough to be the president, um, I would establish the Office of Urban Initiatives and appoint uh, either my friend Kasim or Bill Peduto to be uh, that, that person. Boy, you're a great politician. That's pretty good. <laughs> what about me, Bob? We've known. No, anyway, get the, get the microphone, Bill, please. All right. <laughs> Declined. <laughs> I'm not leaving Pittsburgh. So uh, and the reason I'd never be elected, I, I would start with reforming MPOs, and uh, there would be conditions on what the proposals are. There would be a fix-it-first uh, approach to dealing with our infrastructure as our infrastructure is falling apart. We're building new. We're not taking care of what we already have. It's sort of like owning a house and the roof's leaking and you decide to build a pool. You know, in older cities like ours, uh, we are being left with the bill for 100 years and being asked to somehow be able to, to pay for it and at the same time remain competitive economically when the rates will have to go up to be able to, to fix aging infrastructure. Um, I would do exactly what Mayor Buckhorn said. There needs to be coordination between HUD, DOT, uh, DOE, and we need to sort of pull together plans that actually work together and are able to do what I was talking about before, recognizing the challenges of tomorrow and how opportunity can become a key component on what it is that we fund. And we have to fund more. Uh, we are inadequately looking at our infrastructure in a way that someone down the road is going to pay for it. And just like that roof, if you don't fix it when it leaks, replacing that entire roof costs a whole lot more later on. So there needs to be an uh, immediate need for additional funds. And those are the reasons I'll never be president. <laughs> Polly, you want to start and then Sheila? Well, commission, is this one on? commissioners never get to make the leap that far. but. Um, I would say I, I do have a lot of experience at the federal level, and we are still sitting on a legacy transportation system in the United States that's geared towards the interstate system that I think has done a woeful job of addressing the needs of urban transportation. I was proud when I was at USDT to work on Tiger and actually work with uh, Mayor Buckhorn and Mayor Reed, and we tried to design a program there that played to the strengths of urban America that called for innovation, that was multimodal, that was competitive, that called on local communities to pull themselves together, to have the kind of plan I think that you're talking about in places like Pittsburgh. So certainly whoever's the next president I think needs to embrace that model. And, and I was at a, a, an event yesterday with some of your colleagues, including Mayor Landrieu, who made a good point about the funding question. He said, less is not more. Uh, you know, in New York, we often look to London as our closest sister city. We have about the same populations, around eight and a half million lot of similarities between the two cities. The kind of investments they're making in London right now on the transportation front are extraordinary. The rail, the roadways, they are, they are exploding there in terms of what they're doing compared to, frankly, a comparative U.S. city where I'm proud to say my mayor has put a lot of city resources on the table, but we don't have that same commitment at the state and federal level. So I would say to the next president, I mean, you cannot escape the resource question. Okay. But you, but you won't own up be, becoming the next president. You, you kind of said you don't want to do that, I can tell. <laughs> All right, Sheila. Oh, just, just quickly, um, it would be great if we could take the politics out of solving problems, so that maybe is like at the end of the rainbow pot of gold wish, but um, we need to have a partnership between the cities, the states, and the federal government in solving these problems. I'm from California, and we've had a handful of cities in California that have had major distress, had to file for bankruptcy, and the state's response is, not my problem. That's a problem. We need to have a partnership from the city, state, federal level to solve the issue of infrastructure. 
Okay. Any question from the audience? Okay. Uh, find the microphone. While, you, while he's giving you that, I'm going to ask this question. Um, you know, when we talk about infrastructure, we usually think about bridges and water systems. This whole question about digital inclusion and broadband, and, and we're going through a lot of strife and challenges in our cities right now, and to me, a lot of it is about economics and feeling like you are part of the community, the police community as well. So what, what do we need to do uh, to deal with digital inclusion and the economic piece that it brings in cities? I'll, I'll jump in real quick if that's okay. okay it's just man. ten years ago, this didn't exist. You know, it's um, nobody had a smartphone. You had a BlackBerry, and you were happy if you could read your email. And now you have this technology that's more powerful than the computer that was on your desk. Ten years from now, the way that sensor detection is going to take off, we're just at the very, very beginning of understanding it. So that autonomous vehicle will be able to talk to the traffic signal, that will be able to talk to the vehicle in front of it, and traffic will be able to be cued in ways that we're not even thinking about yet. But it's, it's, it's a reality that's already being created. And with that comes the technology of adding on to it. Everything from creating a backhaul through fiber to be able to power that sensor, to be able to create WiMAX systems that can go over an entire area and being able to provide the backbone for new technology. What makes it inclusive is that you don't redline. So it's not driven primarily by private industry alone so that only the most profitable areas are able to get this, but that it's able to be transcended in federal requirement or required, just like we did with cable that if it's in one part of a city, it's in all parts of a city, and that that opportunity is there for all to be a part of it. I think that we should use an all of the above approach, everything from uh, attracting businesses like Google Fiber. We have uh, the largest Google, Google Fiber uh, deployment in America right now, but you have to make a demand of these businesses. So you just have the, have the conversation. I mean, much in the way that you just phrased the question that you raised, it's the conversation that I have with uh, Google Fiber, with AT&T, and with Comcast, uh, because we have a franchise relationship. The uh, second thing that we're doing is, is we're setting aside the resources uh, to build our own uh, fiber optic system. And so that will make you a player in this space. Uh, it is a longer term solution but it's a solution that has a significant upside for a municipality to, cat, to have that, that kind of capability. And then working with our federal partners through initiatives like Connect Home, um, where the President's administration has an initiative to make sure uh, that any individual that is in a housing authority property uh, has access uh, to broadband. So I think that we have to move on all of those fronts at, at, at once. Okay. Clarence, for, for mayors, it's, it's a moral issue. I mean, if you're not providing access to everybody and equality of access, you don't necessarily have the ability to guarantee the outcome, but you aren't sure how to be able to guarantee that everyone has access to, uh, to broadband. When you have sections of your city where kids can't do their homework at home because they don't have access to broadband capability, then you are immediately starting that process by which they fall further and further behind. And at the end of that route, you talk about income inequality. Well, it starts right there. And so for us as mayors, I mean, it, it's, it's a business decision. And we're about to roll out our Google Fiber as well. And we were chosen for a Connect America grant as well. And, and so you have to negotiate a hard deal with some of these providers because they may not be inclined to do it because it may not be profitable. But in the larger scheme of things, we've got to do it. We absolutely cannot have any kid in our communities that doesn't have the ability to do his or her homework at night because all of us who are parents know that the bulk of the work is now being done on laptops and whatnot. And if a kid can't do that when, when he or she leaves school, shame on us because the outcome for that young boy or that young girl is not going to be good. He or she will fall further and further behind every year. Mm -hmm. Polly, you got anything? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Your question. And Tom, stay with the microphone. Because sometimes people get kind of long. No. He should hold the microphone. He should hold the microphone. Each city has its unique problems, as we're listening. 
here. And I want to, he gave a hypothetical on if you would have been president. I'm going to give you a complicated hypothetical. We have two cities near us geographically, Atlantic City, which across the country now has gambling throughout the whole United States, has destroyed uh, its tourist base. What ideas do you have if you were able to talk to the mayor of Atlantic City to bring it back to life so it's not washed in the ocean? And um, the other city is Camden. They've got the 76er practice facility going over there. They have um, taken some business from Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. It doesn't seem to revitalize that city, even if it, when we're dumping money into that city. What advice would you do to bring that city back to life? So we have two cities across the river, Camden and New Jersey. Have, each one has different problems. And Camden seems to be getting a lot of money, but I don't seem to see anything working there. And Atlantic City, it's in the process of trying to bring itself to life. What advice would you give to both mayors? And if you don't have any knowledge about the cities, you know, I could understand that you're not from the area. I got you. Thank you. Yeah, it's... Uh... Um, I mean, it, I, I'll approach uh, both cities this way. Um, and I, I don't know the mayors of those cities, but, uh, you know, most of us up here took on challenges during the worst of the worst of times. So um, when I got, uh, became the leader of the city of Atlanta, a city with a $2 billion budget, had $7.4 million in cash reserves. We were broke. We were on our knees. City Hall was closing early on Fridays. We were <coughs> furloughing police officers and firefighters. So I don't want to disparage those other cities, but I do believe that when you um, or in a position of a Camden or a, New, or a New Jersey, you have an obligation to strip away the parts that aren't working so you can get back to the essence of a city. Um, the best book that I've read on governing is a book called Instruction to Deliver by Michael Barber. And basically what it says is in times of challenge, you are better off as a leader stripping away and, and going to the essence and doing the basics well. So if I were a mayor of either one of those cities, I would go back to what are the basics and I would start delivering the basics well because what, what Michael Barber talks about is if you can't deliver the basics, people won't believe you for anything else. So they wouldn't believe me if I were trying to reform uh, New Jersey's Atlantic City if I didn't have the strength to do the things that were necessary to bring it back to providing basic service as well. So my own example would be um, when I took over in Atlanta, we had, um, we were spending 18% of our, all of the cash that came in the door on our pension obligations. And we had a $1.5 billion pension liability that was basically crowding out everything else. We passed the most sweeping pension reform of any major city in America and now our credit has gone eight positions to double A plus. So if I were in Atlantic City or if I were in Camden, I'd spend a lot of time talking to the people that I represent about what is the essence of our city, what is it about us that's special and unique, and then I would have a mission-driven approach to getting back to that and doing it well. And what I find in government is, um, you know, conquering armies don't go home, they go conquer something else. <laughs> And so step by step, win by win, people around you start crowding in and helping. I don't know if that's what my colleagues have seen. I'm not privy to the uh, travails of either city either, but I think what you heard from Mayor Reed is that, that mayors are problem solvers. I mean, we, we, we don't have the luxury of pushing the problem down the road or kicking the can down the road. We've got to fix it because it's staring us right in the face. The one thing that I would suggest to them, though, is the recognition that you're not competing as individual cities anymore, that you're competing as regions. And to the extent that they can benefit from, and we know that New York is the 900-pound gorilla, if you will, um, but there are, there are places where that they can cooperate, where they can jointly market, and they can all benefit as a result of what is going on in each of their respective cities. I mean, we have a city right across the bay from us, uh, St. Petersburg, which historically Tampa has always fought with. Well, we're stronger together, and we complement each other, and we benefit from each other's successes, and, and the mayor of St. Petersburg, the new mayor, and I have been friends for 25 years, 
And so we market our region to the world. We don't market St. Pete versus Tampa. We are joined at the hip, um, and we tell that story collectively, and the end result is um, a much better uh, partnership in two, six cities that are, two cities that are much more successful. So, you know, to the extent that Atlantic City can feed off of New York and New York can feed off of Camden and vice versa and share in the wealth, I mean, I think they'll end up in a much better position than trying to carve out a unique identity for themselves, you know, on a global stage when you're competing with much larger metropolitan regions. So much of Western PA still hasn't dug itself out from the economic collapse. Um, some of you may know Mayor John Fetterman from Braddock. He's that big six foot eight guy who ran for U.S. Senate, great, great leader. He represents a city that went from 20,000 to 2,000. So they lost 90% of their people. And the way that he approaches the city is that it's two tracks. The first is take care of what's there. So take care of the kids, take care of the seniors, take care of the people that are there, provide the needed services, as Mayor Reed said, to those that are presently there and then the second track is, who wants to move to Braddock? So it's sort of like, honey, should we move to Camden or Bucks County? Like there's not a person who's making that decision, right? So who are the people that are moving to Braddock? Who wants to be in the urban din of a US steel mill that lights up at night with fire coming out of it? Artists, others, people moving from around the country that want the Uber experience of the industrial landscape and he builds around that as well so he brings others in that want to live in a bank that was built in 1900 that has marble walls and they want to call that home and he builds around that opportunity in a, almost a marketing way uh, because there are people that want and long for that but the key of it is is the people who are still there and the opportunities which could be a pre-K program that's universal because it wouldn't cost that much and finding creative partners to be able to finance it or a scholarship program that helps kids that are able to get through high school to be able to get to college. Something that rewards the people who have stayed through the, the bad times. Okay, um, let me get probably one or two more. We have a reception right after this and I hate to, but if you could be succinct and I'm not gonna ask all of you to respond just quickly. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I would uh, like to ask how you will incorporate the, um, the surrounding boroughs and townships into your infrastructure plan. Uh, because certainly if you build the city up, then it's not going to do a whole lot of good if all the townships and boroughs around you are falling down. And yes. so how will you do that? I think that's a regional question. Anybody want to? tackle that quickly? I think Tom part of it there. is at the 30,000 foot level, the, the mayors have the biggest pulpit in their respective communities. And if you lay out a vision that incorporates everybody and doesn't exclude anybody, if, if you talk about how interconnected the su suburban communities are to the urban core, I mean, both of our cities double in size every day as people come from the bedroom communities into the urban core. But you've got to set a tone and a tenor for that discussion that says, look, we're all in this together. And that, you know, the city may be the dominant economic engine, but at the same time, we all benefit uh, by the city's success as well as the suburban area's success. And so as you look at infrastructure, particularly mobility options, and providing options to the suburbs to get people commuting into the city, I mean, we don't have rail, you heard me say that earlier. We need rail desperately to get folks off of the interstate um, but it's got to be a, a, a regional solution, not just a city of Tampa specific solution. Right. Yes, sir. Right quickly. I realize it's, it's, yeah, it's, I realize right. it's simplist, simplistic, but I'm just curious, what role does bicycles have in your uh, infrastructure thinking? Okay. What uh, role does bicycles have? going to jump real quick. Uh, it has to be multimodal. In the 50s, we designed roads for automobiles. Today we have to uh, design public space for automobiles, public transit, people with needs, pedestrians, and it has to be done in a, in a holistic approach. All right, Alderman Joe Moore from Chicago. That's you, Joe. You. Oh, okay. Yeah, Joe Moore from Chicago, Illinois. I'm also former chair of Democratic Municipal Officials. 
Um, question, we talked about how, how difficult it is to get our federal and state partners to support our infrastructure needs. When we do, there's a lot of emphasis on roads. And roads are important, but uh, particularly central cities have uh, needs uh, for public transportation. And even when we get money for public transportation, it's usually for sexy new projects versus rebuilding what we already have. So what suggestions do you have of how we can convince our state and federal partners to uh, support public transit, particularly rebuilding the public transit we have? You're my last. One of the things that when Kasim's the president, I'm going to ask him to do is, is get the state out of the business of being a pass-through for the cities. Because what happens is the federal government runs it through the state. The state then sends it to the city. They take their VIG. You've got legislators in, in, in red states like ours that are entirely controlled by the Republicans who don't want to support infrastructure in the cities because they don't think the folks who live in the cities vote for them. And so they're more inclined to pursue a suburban type development pattern because that's where they know their voters are going to be. So let's get the state out of the process. Let's have the federal government work with mayors and cities and drive those revenues down to where the, where the, uh, where the biggest impact could have. Um, you know, convincing legislators that mobility options are important, um, I, I have found to be a, a frustrating and not a very productive discussion. They just don't get it. I mean, they really don't get it, and they're not, they don't want to be helpful to the urban areas for a lot of different reasons most of which are not altruistic. I think the greatest opportunity is a partnership with the business community on that conversation. So in the last uh, 30 months, we have had 13 regional or national headquarters move their businesses into the core of the city. All of those relocations have been near transit. And so it, it removes the conversation from a Republican-Democrat uh, conversation where you see jobs that were that were typically in suburbs being moved into the city core. So that changes the most conservative members' view uh, when they see uh, 3,600 NCR, for example, used to be in Gwinnett County, which is a wonderful county in our region. But they moved 3,650 jobs with an average salary in excess of $70,000 off of Peachtree Street in Midtown Atlanta. That's not a, that's a, that's a Democrat-Republican conversation. Um, State Farm is building an 8,000-person campus. They put it near a MARTA stop. And so I think that, that when the business community <coughs> and these jobs decisions that, um, are, uh, that people are making, they put you in a position to change the conversation, and you can have that conversation with anybody because millennials have voted. They've made up their mind. Uh, a, a, a survey that is 20 months old asked teenage drivers in Germany whether they would rather drive a car or have a mobile phone. And everybody in the room knows that mobile phones <laughs> won 70%. And so this isn't a rural urban conversation. This is a do you want to have jobs that people want? And I find it highly effective for the business community that's making decisions, because the only thing you're seeing in Atlanta, by and large, are large businesses locating their businesses near the kids coming out of Georgia Tech. Yep. Putting them right next to Georgia Tech or Emory or the Atlanta University Center. So you have a different conversation with your conservative friends. Yep. And say, my goodness, I mean, do you really want to see another company pull up 1,200 jobs because a kid doesn't want to sit in traffic. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully that conversation will help you. It helped me get the General Assembly to authorize uh, a vote for $3.5 billion for an expansion of our MARTA system. And my state is as conservative. Uh, it is more conservative uh, than Illinois. Polly? I, I want to agree with Mayor Buckhorn. That I really think we need some structural challenges. I mean, you, you mentioned the state and the VIG. New York City DOT, I'm a five thousand person, two and a half billion dollar a year agency. I get seven percent of my funding, give or take, in a given year from the state. They sign off on 
every little thing I do. It often adds a year or two and a lot of expense to the project. I think that's a, a structural thing we need to overcome. On the transit side, you know, speaking of urban renaissance, 50 years ago when our Metropolitan Transportation Agency was formed, the city was in financial trouble, basically bankrupt. The state was very powerful. So it's a state agency. But now, in a lot of ways, things have really changed. The city is the financial engine of the state. Our population has grown by a million people. Our subway ridership is surging. We're now at 1.8 billion riders a year. We often hit 6 million subway riders in the course of a day. But the agency is a state-controlled agency. Funding comes from our state legislature. And yes, I, I agree with the mayor. I don't know that we're ever going to persuade them. I think we need to think of some fresh governance models uh, that will better reflect sort of now the urban growth and dynamism that needs to have a bigger say in how we invest transportation dollars. All right, one last question and we're done. Thank you very much. Uh, Zach Schaefer, uh, Executive Director of Infrastructure Week. Um, I have, a, I guess, kind of a follow-up question, actually, for the mayors and Commissioner uh, at Trottenberg. As the new administration takes office and looks to a significant uh, funding opportunity for infrastructure, what is more valuable to you? Uh, fixing some of the systemic challenges in the Highway Trust Fund and other funding vehicles or stimulus, which has been talked about a lot on the platform lately. Okay, Commissioner, you start. Oh, absolutely making the structural changes. And look, the, the stimulus was a wonderful bill, and again, I got to serve in the Obama administration, and I think it was a wonderful uh, boon for the country, for cities and states. But, you know, one other way you can compare what we do in the U.S. when you look at other countries, it is right now taking us, in a lot of cases, twice as long and twice as much money to put our projects in the ground as even, you know, very similar economies in, in Europe, let alone what they're doing in Asia. And I just think, even before we solve the funding question, one of the ways I know these elected officials would want to show their constituents, we're spending your money wisely, we're giving you real results. And so I do think there's a lot of structural things that we should do. Uh, and, you know, then obviously, um, it'd be lovely to have another stimulus. Um, but I think the structural things are the things that will endure. Well, let me, uh, first of all, let's thank the panel for uh, great presentations. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to look at Sean and Bob and say that we need to get the content from this and, and really put a good report because, you know, oftentimes you have a lot of panels and discussions, but you don't have specific recommendations. I think we got some specific recommendations on what needs to happen in America. Uh, for cities to get the infrastructure support and financing uh, uh, structures that's important. You know, we have a number of elected officials. I, I just saw uh, Mayor Sylvester Turner, who served in the legislature, uh, served in the legislature in 1989 to 2016. Now you're in real government now, Mayor, and uh, welcome aboard. Um, our second VP, uh, Mayor Stodola from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, he is going <laughs> After November, if things go as they should, he will be my best friend for a while from Little Rock, Arkansas. So, um, and you know, we got elected officials from all over the country, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, I saw you here, and uh, I just think um, this is a great audience to be able to hear about what we need to do, whether it's in LA uh, with uh, you, uh, Joe, or your mayor, uh, whether it's in uh, Philly, but we have an opportunity to stand up for cities and not just allow this conversation to be had and not demand that whoever becomes president respects and recognize that what happens in cities and the economy of cities uh, whether it's with Mayor Lerner or others out of Florida, we need to stand up a little taller and not just take pictures. We need to demand the funding and the recognition that uh, city leaders need to have in partnership with our private uh, sector partners. So thank you all so much. Thanks to the staff that put this together. It really turned out to be fantastic. Have a great rest of the DNC. Where are you going to move it to?